Community Canvas Church. This is Pastor Mike, back with another edition of Midweek Thoughts. And uh, this week I want to do something a little bit different and do a book review on a book that I just finished. Uh, This is a 383-page book that you may not have the time or the effort to to wade through on your own. And so I call this my gold mine book review because I'm going to take some of the gold nuggets that I found in this book that I thought were interesting and present them to you uh, to see if maybe they're helpful to you in some way. And so the book I want to talk about is called The Organized Mind written by Daniel Levitin. Uh, It's a great book, uh, really looking at the brain and uh, this amazing uh, tool that we have called our brains. And his main point is that we live in an information age. And so you and I know with the internet at our fingertips, uh, we're being bombarded with more information than any other generation before us. And so what do we do with all of that? Well, oftentimes it leads to being very unorganized and confused and we forget things. We can't keep things straight in our mind. We misplace things. And so this book is all about how our brain functions so that we can uh, be better organized in, in our world and so that we can function better in our world. And his main point is essentially, you can't really keep it all straight in your brain. There's too much going on. There's too much information. And so much like with a computer, uh, you have a you have an external hard drive. And so sometimes you'll save things to that hard drive that you don't want to just keep on your computer to clutter up your computer. Uh, That's essentially what we need to do with our brains. He says, look, if you've got something that you're trying to remember, write it down, Um, put Put things that are in in your brain uh, into something external. Uh, put put it all offload some of that stuff under the external world, and that will help to to keep things straight up here. And so uh, he has all sorts of fascinating things that he brings up. One of those is even uh, talking about things like um, doing that is essentially like getting a souvenir. Now, a souvenir comes from the French word that means to remember. And so you buy some trinket somewhere, right? You get something because you're like, okay, uh, on this trip, I'm never going to remember all of these experiences that I'm having. But if I get some kind of souvenir, then that will trigger something in my mind and it will bring those memories out that may be hard to, to dig around and find. And so um, he talks about that's that's what we need to do to help locate these things in our brains. It's fascinating that uh, within our brain, our, our brain is actually talking to itself all the time and and even dozing off. Sometimes when you think, man, I, I just dozed off there for a minute and, I, and my, my brain just went blank and I forgot. Well, that, that actually happens, right? Parts of your brain take naps when they're not needed so other parts of your brain can take over. And so if there's a nagging feeling of, oh, I got to call this person, I have to you know, send this email, I have to pay this bill, and it keeps coming up when you're trying to concentrate on something else, this is when Levin's, uh, Levitin says, offload that on, onto something in the external world. So write it down so that you have a written reminder <clears throat> out there, and that gives your brain permission to, to leave that alone. It's not keep nagging you. It's We have uh, that with our son, right? If he, uh, Everett, will ask for a snack and if we don't give it to him right away, a few seconds later, mommy, can I have a snack? A few seconds later, if he doesn't have it, mommy, can I, you remember about that snack, right? It's uh, our brain does that to us so that we don't forget important things. And so it's good to write those down so we don't forget them. He also has a good quote about happiness. Listen to what he says. He says, recent... Research in social psychology has shown that happy people are not people who have more. uh, Rather, they are people who are happy with what they already have. Being content is not about what you don't have. It's about what you do have. And I think this lines up so well with what Paul says in the book of Philippians. Listen to what he says. Philippians chapter 4, he says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things uh, through him who gives me strength. Paul's saying, even if everything else is is taken away from me, if I have Christ, if I have Jesus in my life, then that thing is enough to make me content. It's not about what I don't have. It's about what I do have. 
another interesting thing that can happen as far as as far as your own happiness is concerned is when you bring up a memory when you recall a memory uh, you can actually edit that memory based on your current emotional state your current mood and so if you remember a memory and you're thinking on that but but emotionally at that moment you're not doing well well that's going to color that memory and so when you when you log it back in your mind again the next time you pull it up it will have been altered from from the last time you pulled it up and if you ever saw the movie inside out this really the, the pixar movie it's my favorite pixar movie it really plays off of that where you have these yellow core memories yellow being the color of, of joyful memories but sadness the character sadness when she touches the memory it starts to turn blue and so the character of joy is saying, don't touch these, you're changing these memories. Well, that actually happens when we pull up memories based on what our current mood is. Uh, and along with that, uh, he talks about social rejection. And so when you are, uh, when, when you face rejection, when you are hurt socially, that actually activates the same part of your brain that activates when you experience physical pain. And what that says is that we're deeply social beings and i'm so glad that uh, they they have moved away from the term social distancing and are saying physical distancing because for us to socially be distant from each other will, will eat us up from the inside out uh, we are created as social beings the bible presents the, the truth of who we are as being created to know god to be in relationship with him and with each other and so it makes sense that uh, to, to be rejected socially activates the same part of the brain as, as physical pain. He also goes on to talk about choices. Now listen to this. I think this is so interesting. The past generation has seen an explosion of choices facing us as consumers. In 1976, the average supermarket stocked 9,000 unique products. Today, that number is 40,000. But the average person gets 80 to 85% of their needs in only 150 different items. So that means the next time you go to the grocery store, you are likely going to ignore 39,850 items in the store. And so he uses that as, a, as an example of just how much we're having to, to organize things in our life, how much we're having to say no to things in order to focus on these other things. There's so much coming at us, even when you go to the grocery store. And perhaps in our time uh, in quarantine right now, well, maybe we're starting to realize there are certain things that are far more important than other things. And many of our choices have, have been set aside. Many of the, the things that we that normally filled our lives have, have uh, are not there right now during this season of life. And maybe it's causing us to realize, you know, I don't need so many choices. I don't need so many options in order to be satisfied, in order to be happy. In fact, they've actually found that too many choices leads to less happiness. So if you go to, you know, marble slab or somewhere and you've got 30 options of ice cream and you're debating between a few different kinds and you choose one, typically you're less happy because because there's this thing that goes on in our head where we start to worry Maybe I chose wrongly. Maybe there's a better thing I could have chosen. Where if there's less choices, maybe just three or four or five, that happens far less. And so more choices doesn't necessarily lead to more happiness. And so, uh, so I would ask myself and I would ask you guys, have you taken a look at what you do have during this time? Uh, are we being thankful and grateful for what we do have during this time? And are we focusing on those things rather than wishing we had all these other things that are currently unavailable to us? A couple other things that he talks about. One is multitasking, where I think before this whole coronavirus thing, so many of us were trying to do so much. We were trying to multitask and we thought that was the most effective way to be productive. But they've actually found that it's not a very productive way to uh, to function. We think we're multitasking, but really what we're doing is just moving from different tasks rapidly. So we're, we'll work on this for a little bit, and then we work on this, or in our minds we think about this, and then we think about this, then we think about this. 
Well, that's pretty taxing on us. In fact, when we multitask, our brains um, release uh, an increased amount of, of stress hormones, as well as adrenaline, which typically will cloud our thinking and, and exhaust us. It also creates a dopamine addiction feedback loop. And so dopamine, right, is, is, is addictive. It's that feel good, um, uh, it's the feel good hormone that, that uh, our, our brain uh, has. And, and so when we do certain things, we get a dopamine hit and we're like, oh, I like that. I want to do that again. Well, we get a little bit of that when we, uh, when we multitask. And so it actually, the more we multitask, the more we train and addict our brains to, to, to get distracted. To, to find things in the external world that are unrelated to what we're currently working on, uh, you actually end up e with even less energy by the end of multitasking. It takes less energy to focus, right? And so, so ideally, if we are to focus to be productive rather than multitasking, we'll actually get a lot more done but also we'll feel better afterwards because we will have used less energy. And just to go along with that, he talks about productivity. And he says those companies that are winning the productivity battle are actually those that allow their employees certain productivity hours, but also naps, a uh, chance to exercise, a calm, tranquil, and orderly environment to do their work. Uh, in fact, a 10 minute nap can be the equivalent of an extra hour and a half of sleep the night before. And so some companies are finding, man, if we create a certain, uh, a certain atmosphere, if, if, we, uh, if we allow for certain things uh, to focus on the personal health of our employees, then their productivity actually goes up. In fact, a 60-hour work week is 25% less productive than a 40-hour work week which shows just increasing the amount of time that you work doesn't make you more productive. It's about focusing, it's about being intentional, and it's about being, uh, being healthy, taking care of yourself at the same time. It's all connected. And so might, might it be that those of us who are getting less concentrated hours of work are realizing how to be actually more productive. It's hard to find time even to film a video like this with three young boys under five running around and screaming all the time. And so it's nap time right now is when I'm filming this. I'm starting to realize, you know, if, if you can focus, you can be far more creative with less time. And so uh, Isaac Newton, many generations ago, uh, he, uh, he actually faced a, a sort of quarantine like we are. There was a plague that was uh, that was going through London, and so he moved out to this uh, to this farm area several miles outside of the city. And for two years, he was able to pull himself away from all the craziness and focus. And you know what happened in those two years? Well, he invented calculus and he discovered the nature of light and the laws of gravity. <laughs> no pressure, but what are we gonna do with our time? That's what Newton did with, with his time in quarantine. What are we going to do? Because you know what my biggest takeaway from this book was? Was that God has equipped us with an amazing tool called the brain. And so will we uh, take the time to, to maximize our creativity, our production, uh, and our focus all for his glory? Will we take what he has given us and use it to give back to him. I hope that we uh, that we do that during uh, this unique time that we're living in right now. And so I hope some of that has been helpful to you. Uh, Canvas Church, don't forget that you are loved by God, you're loved by your church family, and we're walking this journey together. And so until next time, we'll see you again soon.